species of primate. This little monkey, which Mark named Dwarf Marmoset in 1998, and later described as Calibea humilis, launched a long line of new discoveries. Since then, Mark claims to have discovered more than 20 other previously unknown primates, and also a dwarf porcupine with a pink nose. Also interested in botany, Mark's research on the plants of the region are a standard text. It was Time magazine that dubbed him a hero of the planet because of his commitment to conservation work. Mark's recent work focuses on the forests surrounding the Aripuanya River, an area of Brazilian rainforest the size of France. It takes a special knowledge to be able to pick out a new species from this vast sea of green. Looking for something new in this animal mecca is like looking for a needle in a biological haystack. Why is it so important to find new species? species add considerable weight to his case to have this forest declared a sanctuary. It could be argued that some of the rarer animals and plants here are protected elsewhere, making a local sanctuary unnecessary. But if Mark could show that a unique kind was found here and nowhere else, it would greatly strengthen his chances. start looking for a new species of animal unknown to science. Mark has an unlikely source. He visits some friends that he considers to be the true field scientists, the people who've lived along the Aripanya River for generations. They have contact with all sorts of animals, from macaws to curassows, parrots to primates. Monkeys can end up as pets, and Mark knows that one family's pet might just turn out to be the world's scientific bombshell. He regularly visits the villagers or caboclos. Doña Teresa invites him to see their latest addition. It's an adolescent marmoset. Doña Teresa took care of it after its mother was killed for the pot. The monkey belongs to a species that Mark described for the first time in 2000. He called it Mico Manicorensis, after the town of Manicore on the Madeira River. The marmoset probably wouldn't live long in captivity, and Doña Teresa exchanges it for a bag of beans. Mark never pays for his fines. He doesn't want animals captured deliberately. So that's exactly the way how I get all the monkeys. Because these pe people, local people, live on subsistence hunting. So they kill the mothers. And if they have dependent babies, they keep them like this one. And um, what, what is just what they put in the pot is scientific material for me. Not only are the animals saved from a cramped and uncertain future, but they could help Mark get protection for animals so rare that they're completely unknown to the outside world. As Mark speeds away, the skies open over the village. Here, every year, up to seven meters of water drench every square meter of forest floor in the floodplain forest. Once the soil is saturated, water seeps into the rivers. In some places, the water levels swell seasonally by over 10 meters leaving nothing but the canopy stretching beyond the water's surface. Now flowers blossom, and fed by the nutrient-rich waters, fruits ripen.
creatures normally hidden in the depths of the forest and high up out of view descend to the floodplain to feed, making them easier to see. Among them, the spider monkey, one of the largest monkeys on the continent. Spider monkeys are easily distinguishable. They have the longest tails in the monkey family, which are used like a fifth limb to swing through the branches. Living in large troops, they split into smaller foraging parties during the day, spreading out to find the best feeding spots. The similar looking woolly monkey eats a more varied diet of insects and small animals, but also descends to enjoy the rich fruit bounty. With food in abundance, there's plenty of time for play. Above water, any creature would have trouble making their way through the tangle of branches. But beneath the surface, it's a different story. Released from the cramped confines of the river, fish disperse between the submerged tree trunks. Animals that usually travel by foot are forced to swim. Sloths usually crawl from tree to tree. Now, though, they must paddle. Moving at their own pace, they're surprisingly good swimmers. But that's about as energetic as a sloth ever gets. Other strange forms swim by. Giants lurking in the murky water. According to legend, when sailors of old glimpsed these creatures at sea, they mistook them for mermaids. The resemblance is not very striking. These are Amazonian manatees, or sea cows, one of a few species called Cyrenians. They look like whales, but are in fact closely related to the elephant. Meanwhile, back on board the Calibeya, the little marmoset has settled in well and become a much-loved member of the crew. Beady-eyed, he spots a stowaway, a praying mantis, a tasty snack for the liverboard pest control. Mark enjoys his new companion, but knows their time together is limited. Mark always takes the time to catch up with his neighbors and makes regular house calls to consult these local zoologists. Mark hears many remarkable stories from his friends. Who knows what creatures they will find? Ephraim tells of a large creature living in the jungle surrounding their village. Could this be a species unknown to science? At first, it doesn't sound all that remarkable. A tapir. According to the science books, just one species of tapir lives here, the South American tapir. Textbooks say four species of tapir live in the jungles of South America and Asia the last members of an ancient family of animals related to horses and rhinos. The South American Brazilian tapir is the heaviest land mammal on the continent, weighing around 250 kilos. Tapirs all have the prehensile trunk, but the South American can be identified by the distinctive white ear tips and pale feet. But the animal Ephraim describes is half the size and jet black all over. If this were to turn out to be a new species, it would be electrifying. This may be the only place where the dark tapir lives, and without the knowledge of studies, it could be on the brink of extinction. It's vital to find out more, and that is Mark's mission in life. But the locals haven't finished yet. Peccaries look like pigs, but are more closely related to hippos. Science describes two species in the Amazon, the widespread collared peccary, and the much larger and noisier white-lipped peccary. This species has a more limited range and moves through the forest in noisy groups of 100 animals or more. That's not what the locals see on their hunts. They describe four peccaries, including another white-lipped species that is redder in color and has white feet, and another kind they call Caetitumunde, the giant peccary. Unlike other peccary species living in herds, the much larger Caetitumunde is only seen in small family groups. They recall hunts for this larger prey. The world of museums, biology and scientific journals means little to these men. They just want to make sure their children have enough to eat. They sometimes hunt the giant peccary. Like other members of its family, it aggressively defends itself. But an animal this size provides a lot of meat. 
no white collar, no white lip. Their dinner is a species completely unknown to science. As the days pass, the Calibea takes Mark and his crew further into the forest. What new surprises lie in wait? The golden morning sun reveals little sandbanks, the first signs that the floodwaters are subsiding. Already, these fingers of land have attracted skimmers who loudly lay claim to the banks. One morning, Mark has some surprise visitors. The men have killed another peccary, but knew their dinner would be of interest to Mark. The meat has already gone to feed their families, but the men kept the skin and pinned it out to dry. Mark instantly notes the large size, the stiff black mane, and the absence of a white lip or white collar. This skin comes from an animal unknown to science, a giant peccary. As Mark sits with his monkey friend, he recalls a similar gift and what may turn out to be the biggest discovery of his career. I was extremely uh, lucky when I came to this little village on the Aipana River uh, to do my usual interviews. And then the people told me that they just had uh, hunted a manatee in the creek here. And then I was asking them, how many types of manatee do you know? And they said two. And then I, I noticed, I, I, I was aware that this was a new species. Frankie describes the animal killed. It was tiny, not much more than a meter in length, black with a distinctive white heart shape on its chest. Could it really be possible that such an impressive creature has managed to go unnoticed for so long? How might the dwarf manatee compare to its larger cousins? The Amazonian manatee is a rotund animal growing close to three meters in length with a broad paddle-shaped tail and a flexible whiskered muzzle. Its body is a uniform dark gray with irregular flecks of white on the underside. All known manatees have a low reproductive rate, making them especially vulnerable to the effects of hunting and habitat loss. Will stories of a dwarf manatee hold water? Or are they just another myth of the region? Mark left the village with more than just stories. Once again, the kind people of the Aripuanya let him keep the leftovers of their meal. Later, Mark is able to compare a skull of a common Amazonian manatee with his new treasure. The skull and jawbone of what he believes is a dwarf manatee. Although similar in appearance, there are finer details that tell them apart. So the, 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 the most striking differences are the long elongated snout of the common one and the small one has a very short trunk. Another striking difference is the brain case size. It's very narrow and, uh, in, the, in the common manatee. And then the small uh, dwarf manatee has, has a relative much large, larger brain size. Francis guides Mark up the Aripuanya River to the creek where the manatee was killed, hoping that there might be more in the same area. They spot one of the Amazon's oldest inhabitants. A bird whose ancestors rubbed shoulders with the dinosaurs. The Hoatzin. Hoatzins are known locally as the smelly pheasant for the musky odor they produce. But these birds are a biological wonder, a visual aid to the process of evolution. The chicks still have prehistoric features, including claws on their wings, just like Archaeopteryx, considered widely to be the first bird. They use the claws to scramble through the branches in the flooded forest. 
the claws disappear before adulthood. Hoatzins are unique birds with complex stomachs to digest tough vegetation. Special bacteria needed for this harsh diet is passed to the chicks from their parents. The Hoatzin is a natural wonder and another threatened species in need of protection. Francis directs Mark into the Arawatsino, a tributary some 40 kilometers long. Overgrown and shallow, this flooded forest is clearly not suitable for bigger common manatees. But it could probably accommodate a smaller species. It is not an easy place to look. As a primatologist, Mark never stops scouring the treetops for monkeys. He spots one of the smaller residents of the canopy, a squirrel monkey. I learned from the monkeys how to survive in the forest and um, what you can eat and what you can't eat by observing them. They taught me how to uh, make a living without killing any animal. Mark has become a vegetarian, mimicking the monkeys' fruity diets. Charismatic squirrel monkeys are among the monkey man's favorite subjects. The creek narrows with fallen trees forming barricades, but there is clearly lots of leaf matter. Could this be the food of the dwarf manatee? Deadwood lies across their path, but Mark won't allow such minor obstacles to get in his way. not when the river ahead may hold such a huge secret. As the search for a new species continues, Mark hears a song that is music to his ears, the duet of titty monkeys. These monkeys also mean a lot to Mark. They were one of his earliest discoveries. He described them back in 2002. He named them Prince Bernhard Titty Monkeys in honor of his supporter, the Dutch Prince Bernhard. Much of their lives remain a mystery. They've never been filmed in the wild before now. The end of the road. But at least Mark has samples of the dwarf manatee's food. This is about the far as we can get um, after all these logs in the, over the river. But I'm, I'm happy uh, to have seen the habitat of the dwarf manatee because the local people in Francis, they say that uh, uh, the dwarf manatee is uh, feeding mainly on these two species of Eliogaris grass. If this is true, it would make the dwarf manatee differ in its feeding behavior from its larger cousin. The Amazon manatee feeds at the surface on floating plants. It seems that the new species may be a bottom feeder. Mark will have to try again in the dry season. Once home, the Calibea gets another visit. The unusual watchman announces their arrival. River traders bring in supplies of eggs and flour. Mark always exchanges news with these people. As the traders spend their whole time traveling up and down the river, they often have useful information and current news. September sees a change in the weather. The huge floodwaters finally subside, revealing the forest floor once more. The Calibea's progress has slowed to negotiate newly emerging sandbanks.
Mark uses the downtime to revisit a childhood fantasy, the lost world. Not so fanciful now as Mark searches for missing giants himself. Carrie Bayer's captain weaves her slowly through treacherous sandbanks, some of which he can barely see below the surface. At the height of the dry season, the river reveals its skeleton, with sandbanks sticking out like ribs from the murk. Nesting birds, such as night jars, crouch on their nests to prevent the sun hard boiling their eggs. People lived here as far back as the Stone Age, and now the newly exposed rocks tell an ancient story. Here the Stone Age Indians clearly depicted a, a, a manatee. He has the tail of the manatee, and he has, yeah, he has the head. And I consider this a, a good omen for the, in the search for the dwarf manatee. Maybe they depicted the dwarf manatee. I hope so. This is one of the nicest uh, gravings here. It's of a uh, dolphin. It's a long elongated snout and a uh, high forehead. Unlike other dolphins, pink river dolphins or bottos can turn their necks because the vertebrae have not fused. When the forest floods, bottos twist through the tree trunks. They have long tooth-lined beaks and in the murky waters of the Amazon, have lost the need for sight. Their tiny eyes give them a prehistoric appearance. The dolphins use sophisticated internal sonar to avoid collision in the gloom. Sonar doesn't prevent collisions above the surface though. The Calibea has run aground for the fourth time. It takes a little patience and some careful navigating to get them back on track. Finally, the ship reaches the Arawazino Creek. Home, Mark believes, to the dwarf manatee. It snakes back into the heart of the mysterious rainforest. Could secret creatures live here, hidden from human eyes? After months underwater, the sandy riverbanks are rich in minerals from decaying vegetation. Butterflies flock to lick up the nutritious cocktail. The water is refreshing to drink as well, despite its off-putting color. Mark is anxious to press on in his search for the dwarf manatee. A find this size could draw international attention to the region, perhaps creating pressure to give it official protection saving not only a new species, but protecting the habitat of the monkeys that Mark so loves. With that fresh inspiration, he presses on in his search. Francis joins him again, along with his brother Ephraim. Logs and branches clog up the creek. Progress upstream is frustratingly slow. It's a bit of a helter-skelter ride, 
and they keep the chainsaw close at hand. This is dangerous work. Francis spots one of the logs they cut just a few months ago, in the rainy season. It shows just how far the water level has dropped, some four or five meters. The speedboat's engine shatters the piece of the rainforest, disturbing the inhabitants. They spot an empty den, but the owners are nearby. The three men stop to get a closer look. Giant otters, the largest members of the ferret family, agile fish eaters at nearly two meters long. Mark decides to take a dip. Giant otters live in large family troops and call loudly to each other through the forest. Once a common sight in the Amazon basin, Hunting for pelts has greatly reduced their numbers. The otters seem reluctant to approach the bather, so Mark takes a look at their home instead. Otters don't always dig their own dens. Sometimes they find a natural cavity, such as this one, in the roots of a tangled tree. Butterflies have gathered on the den floor, perhaps absorbing minerals from the otter's urine or oil from their last fishy meal. Other traces of the feast remain. Large scales, perhaps from the jaraki fish, one of their favorite fish prey. It's a welcome interlude and a reminder of the rare and important species of the region and the need for their protection. The search must continue. You have to be pretty fit to hunt for manatee in the Aripanya River. Only small caimans could live in this shallow creek. The spectacled caiman grows to just over two meters, but unlike its relative, the black caiman, it's unlikely to attack humans. Mark looks for a good spot to begin his search. With a likely looking area selected, the men string a net across the river. They hope that if a manatee is traveling downstream, they'll be able to corral it, holding it in a netted part of the river for a few days, giving Mark a chance to examine it and confirm the discovery. While the trap settles into the river, Mark, ever inquisitive, takes a stroll. Jungle dramas are being played out at all levels, and Mark finds great interest in it all. From the animals to the plants on which they live, he even spots a new species that he found just a few months before. Here's the flower of Gustavia. Uh, so this represents a new species, 
It's amazing because it has the biggest fruit in the genus. It has the most spectacular white uh, distinct flower in the genus. And then uh, it's representing a new species. Yet another new species. More evidence that the biodiversity of the Aripuanya region ranks among the highest in the world. Aside from little reptiles and insects, there are monkeys here too. The new species of marmoset. Mark can't help but take some time to watch their natural behavior. Like most marmosets, this new species appears to live in close-knit family groups, each defending a territory of their own. He hopes soon to return his captive friend to a wild group like this. At the moment, the little monkey is a bit young to stand its ground with a wild pack, but the time will come soon enough. The word marmoset comes from the French for grotesque, but the squirrel-like monkeys have won Mark's heart. Unlike other primates, these have specialized in eating gum. In areas where gum trees are plentiful, there can be as many as 50 groups of marmosets in a single square kilometer of forest. There are much larger animals in the area too. The tapirs are the biggest, pushing their way through the undergrowth with their compact bodies and feeding themselves with prehensile trunks. This is the common species, but maybe others lurk in the forest. Predators of the tapir are few and far between. The great cats have been almost hunted out of existence, though a few pumas still stalk in the shadows. This is the same kind of mountain lion that ranges from Florida to Patagonia. Unlike many cats, these jungle dwellers are quite unafraid of water. With large predators around, Mark has the safety of his blade, but the knife is more for hacking through the dense vegetation than self-defense. We, we set the second fence uh, about one and a half kilometer upstream, but we saw a place where they recently had uh, browsed the Eliogaeus. Yes. Francis tells Mark how the dwarf manatee feeds. So, uh, in July he saw from a distance that, uh, that all these... that an, an, um, manatee was feeding on a place like this. They have um, a sloppy way of, uh, of browsing. They're eating and but then lots of uh, grass stems float and uh, they don't go into the mouth. By contrast, the larger manatee doesn't eat the grass. It's a surface feeder, preferring larger aquatic plants, like water hyacinth. This adds weight to Mark's idea that the smaller dwarf manatee is a bottom feeder. How much food would it need, and what size of territory would it require? The Amazon manatee eats 10 to 15 kilos a day, and spends up to eight hours feeding. They migrate with the rains, and are capable of fasting for up to 200 days during periods of drought. Could this provide a model for the ecology of the new species? The men plan to spend several nights in the forest. The forest provides their evening menu. Watched over by his little companion, Mark catches up on some research. It's important for him to keep up to date with developments in the scientific community. It's easy to nod off when serenaded by a chorus of frogs and insects. Early morning, and the search begins in earnest. The men scour every pool. A few months ago, these fish dispersed through the flooded forest. Now, in the low river, they swim in tight shoals.
the men keep an eye out for hidden dangers. Mark spots a stingray, despite its superb camouflage of sand and stillness. It has a poisonous barb on its tail. If it lashes out, it could inflict an agonizing wound. It's nearly a meter across, but quickly disappears again under a fine dusting of sand. A reminder that even large animals can remain undetected in the forest. A meter and a half later, they reach the downstream net, but hours in the water have taken their toll. I feel very cold. <laughs> I'm totally under cold, and it shows how um, how you can almost freeze to death in, in the rainforest. At, after one and a half um, hours uh, diving and looking under the logs. And under the deep, in the deep pools, uh, we didn't find any um, manatee. Uh, but we, uh, we have good hopes that tomorrow uh, we go uh, another few kilometers upstream. The men dismantle the lowest net and set up again further upstream. They work in this way for one week, covering some 12 kilometers of river. On one trek through the Iguapo, they discover signs of another large animal, the biggest feline predator in the Amazonian jungle. And it has recently sharpened its claws. The predator has left its mark. The scratch marks on the tree trunk show just how high the jaguar stretched more than two and a half meters. The moment that I see this, then I, I think about it as a, as a possible threat. But I still think that a fallen tree or a fallen tree branch is more uh, likely and way to be killed in, in this one. The jaguar, the real lord of the forest, the largest and most secretive cat of the Americas. The dense forest remains its final stronghold. Jaguars are known uh, to prey upon um, aquatic animals um, and caimans, for instance. So it's, it's probably the, the only predator for the dwarf manatee. There's just time for one last swim. Plenty of small caimans, but no dwarf manatees. Mark's frustration grows because everywhere in the creek he sees the blunt ends of the Eleocharis grass. He believes only a manatee would chomp the grass like this. He finds a Stone Age carving of a manatee. Why else would ancient Indians depict a manatee in this small creek unless they'd seen them here? Too soon, they reach the lower net. The search is over. No luck this time. No manatees in, the, in this stretch of the river. Francis, Ephraim and Mark pack up the nets for the last time. The mission is over for the time being. But while they're deep in the forest, one important task remains. Time for one member of the family to say goodbye. 
Mark had never planned to keep his little stowaway and has decided that it's time to return him to the forest. It will be wonderful to see him back in the wild. If Mark hadn't intervened, it would have stayed tied up in a village hut and would not have lived for long. A life in captivity rarely agrees with wild animals. Mark has had plenty of experience rehabilitating orphaned monkeys into the wild and begins by placing his little friend in a suitable spot. The monkey calls out into the forest and from a distance, Mark can watch and wait for somebody to return the call. And he doesn't have to wait long. From past experience, Mark knows that if released near a wild group, this animal will be fine. Confident that the troop will now adopt and care for the youngster, and that the little monkey is big and bold enough to stand up for himself, Mark releases him. It's time to leave the forest and its secrets behind. A little disappointed that they haven't found the manatee, but renewed by the wealth of other wildlife in this region. The river may not have yielded a new manatee, but it seems the forest won't let his efforts go unrewarded. A vulture abandons its meal, an agouti. Mark has never seen this species before. This is an agouti, but I know almost for sure that it's a non-described species of agouti. Agoutis with orange-brown fur live on either side of the Aripuanya River. But this specimen, sandwiched in the middle, has a greenish-black coat. Agoutis are long-legged rodents that forage for fallen fruits and seeds on the forest floor. They're hard to see, fast and agile, able to leap two meters to escape attack. The carcass was a lucky find. Mark may have stumbled across yet another new species of small mammal. And the forest still hasn't finished with Mark. It saves the best to last. A light shower forces the men to rest for a day. Francis and Ephraim tell Mark of a nearby wallow, which they believe will attract animals from the forest. As soon as the rain stops, Ephraim leads him to the spot. These forest people are skilled trackers, a necessity when you're making your living from the rainforest. They don't miss any signs of a passing animal. Among the fresh prints, Ephraim notices something that sends a shiver down Mark's spine. A large hoof print. This wasn't left by a white-lipped peccary, or by a collared peccary. Mark immediately builds a viewing platform, determined not to miss the opportunity of seeing this creature never seen in the flesh before, the peccary known to hunters, yet still unknown to science. He settles down to wait. And wait. And wait. There's plenty to see, but no sign of the peccary. At 
last, his patience pays off. A large animal edges nervously into view. It doesn't have a white lip or a white collar. A giant peccary. It has a stiff black mane, like the skin the hunters gave Mark. It has never been seen by a scientist before, and certainly never filmed. It lives in a small family group, confirming the observations, just as the local people described it. Altogether, there are four, two adults and two youngsters. Mark utterly thrilled takes in every detail. Not only does he get the chance to examine a living animal, but it's being filmed for the first time. Typically for peccaries, the animals are wary. Being one of the larger prey species, they're a favorite meal of jaguars and other larger predators, including man. Then, just minutes after they arrived, the giant peccaries begin to move on. Yeah, I'm so happy now because um, after sitting here for ages on the platform, I finally got some nice footage of a whole family of the new species of peccary. So now I can publish this new species. So I'm, I'm extremely happy and I leave this platform as soon as possible with my treasure. This gives Mark all he needs to announce his discovery to the world, yet another new species. Yet in spite of its natural wealth, this area is not included on a conservation map. This area is so special that I think it deserves um, to be declared by UNESCO and World Heritage Site. Having finally captured the elusive giant peccary on film, Mark was able to reveal this new species to the world. He hopes to argue the case that this amazing biodiversity deserves protection, both for the species we 